What's up, everybody? Welcome into Tom Curran's Patriots Talk podcast, joined as always by the Senator Phil A. Perry. Phil, we are closing in. It's two weeks till the draft, babe. Two weeks to the first round. What do you think? We're going to have Mike Rodak from AL.com, covers the uh, Alabama Crimson Tide. He'll join us to talk about the Bama prospects. But what do you think we're going to be doing in two weeks, Phil? We're going to be talking about a trade up, a trade down. An offensive player or a defensive player? Come on, put your money just on those four options right now. Slide your chips. If I had to guess, I would guess that the Patriots end up sticking and taking a defensive player. All right, sticking and picking. Sticking and picking on defense. And we do have defensive players to discuss with our guy Rodak, one of whom is Christian Harris. He's a linebacker. Phil these linebackers, as I look at all the names, whether it's Nicobe Dean or, or Devin Lloyd, a little bit bigger, but um, or Christian Harris, they they just don't fit the Belichick suit, and he's going to have to veer from what he has become accustomed to. Unless Jawan Bentley's going to be a three down linebacker and be his big dude on the field, and I just don't think he's suited for that. Is there anybody who comes close to looking like Gerard Mayo? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, when you're talking about Mayo, right, you're talking about a really smart guy who was still, even though he wasn't Brandon Spikes or Dante Hightower sized, he did, by the time he got to the NFL and was there for a year or two, he was up to 250. But when he, he was, was drafted. probably drafted in the 240s, right? So you're talking about 240 with pretty good speed, you know, good athlete across the board and smart. There actually are a few of those, Tom. So it, that's sort of what's interesting about um, what looks like the approach they've taken this offseason, and I've reported on this a little bit too, they are more open to smaller bodies because they know the crop of bigger bodies coming to them from the college ranks just is non-existent at this point. The 250-pound guys now play defensive end. And the guys that used to be strong safeties that are 230, 225, now have bumped down and now are linebackers. And we're going to talk about you know the college game a little bit with Rodak and just what the spread has done and even the widened hashes for the college game and all the space that creates on the field and the stress that puts on linebackers who can't run and why mm-hmm. you've seen those guys disappear at that level. There are some bigger backers in this year's draft class, though, all that being said. And so in the Mayo mold of smart and fast and big, there's only a couple that I really would would rattle off the top for you, Tom. And one would be Leo Chanel from Wisconsin, almost 6'3". Love a big 10 guy. 250 pounds, so really good size, but tested like, an incredible athlete, four, five, three, 40, 40 and a half inch vertical, Ooh. 128 inch. Bro- I mean, this guy is a real That's what Mayo did. athlete. He, Mayo was a- four five and had a ridiculous vertical. I mean, he's one of the best athletes to come out of the linebacker spot in, in a long time. So sorry he, to interrupt. No, he was, he was, he was great. So in, in Chanel is, is similar. Now he's really sort of thought to be kind of a downhill thumping kind of player. And I don't know how much you want him dropping in coverage, but he clearly has the athleticism to be able to do some of that and run with some of these guys. The other player that who's a little bit smaller, but I think has a real chance to be an impact player at the next level, six foot three, 240 pounds is Chad Muma from mm-hmm. Wyoming. He's a Wyoming guy. So he doesn't have that level of competition that I think Bill Belichick would love to see, but he played really well at the senior bowl, which we know Belichick values another really good athlete, Low four sixes, so he's not quite uh, Leo Chanel, but 40-inch vertical, 129-inch broad jump, so he edges Chanel there a little bit. 428 short shuttle on a 706. He actually went sub seven seconds at his pro day in the three cone, which is really impressive for somebody that size. So those are two names that have a little bit bigger frame that I think would be, you know, kind of classic Mike's. And, you know, there's one more name, Tom, I just want to mention to you because I think he might end up going ahead of his teammate, N'Kobe Dean. It's Quay Walker from Georgia, who's 6'4", 241, another great athlete, low four fives, broad jump over 10 feet, like three cone at 6'8", 9", in his pro day. Like that just, to me, I can imagine Patriots people having their eyes bulge out of their head when they see that time for a player at his size. He's just not, he wasn't the signal caller. That was obviously mm-hmm. N'Kobe Dean. So he's not quite 
in the Mayo mold in that sense. It's interesting. When you look at the Patriots, when they rebuilt their defense from 2010 to, to 15, Spikes, I think he was a 2010 pick, but Mayo was a, a, an 08 pick, and then Hightower and Jamie Collins. So those were supposed to be their four staples. I think they did pretty good with them. Won a lot of games with those four. Um, but that mix at the linebacker position the of going high tower Chandler Jones, Jamie Collins in consecutive drafts at the top, that tells you something. And 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 Phil, as much as you've talked about the notion, and I think it's smart to, to converse about, will the Patriots just say, screw it on defense, we're going to try and keep up on offense and put points on the board, or do we try and play some defense? You have to. You can't be a non-punt forcing team. You can't be. You can't nope. be an MPFT. Can't do it. Can't have it. Can't live with it. Uh, can't live like that. All right. With all that said, and I love the Chad Muma. I've, I've look, looked at some of his measurables and his highlights, and uh, I just can't imagine not an embrace by Patriots fans for to be yelling Muma every time he comes out there. I mean, if you could Brewski, you could Muma. All right. Coming up, Mike Rodak. AL.com. He's going to get us the skinny on all the Bama players. All right. In comes Mike Rodak from AL.com, the Birmingham News. He has been covering Bama for four years. You remember him from being at ESPN Boston and from covering the Buffalo Bills. So thanks for joining us. Last year, Bama had six first rounders, eight guys in the first two rounds. The Patriots profited. What's their overall group look like in 2022? Big crop? It's about the same size of the overall crop. It's going to be less top heavy, you know, fewer first round picks than what they had last year, but overall still in line with what they've had under Saban in terms of nine or 10 guys total. Good deal. Phil, take it. You're our draft guru. I want you to ask about some of these prime prospects that Bama has that could be patriotic fits. Sure. Well, you know, Evan Neal and Jamison Williams, those are the top two guys, but there is a position of need at linebacker road act that I think the Patriots might be able to address with a Bama guy. Christian Harris is small, weighed in at 226 pounds at the combine, but how might he fit in with the Patriots? How does he compare to other Bama linebackers that we know pretty well? Yeah, he's definitely not a Dante Hightower. Who's that big 255 pound guy that Alabama used to have. 10 years ago, Alabama's gone much smaller. They've gone to guys who can cover. Christian Harris was a, a cornerback in high school who they converted to being an inside linebacker, which shows you how they're thinking at that position. And the guy who I, I don't think was as productive as people maybe wanted him to be or thought he could be this past season, but had a great game to end his time at Alabama against Georgia, two and a half sacks in the national championship game and was all over the field, has the 40 time, has the athleticism that I think uh, mm -hmm. obviously Alabama is looking for in, in these days, but probably the Patriots are as well. Wideouts. There's wideouts, Phil. Who do you, I mean, obviously we've talked Williams a little bit, but it's Meshi and Slade Bolden who might go undrafted entirely. Um, Rodak, your thoughts on those two players in particular, and then Phil, how are you projecting them for patriotic fits? Yeah, Mechie is a guy who I don't think has a standout trait. Otherwise, he'd probably be a first-round pick. He's not the fastest guy. He's not the biggest guy, but he's a solid player. I think he's a solid number two at the NFL level. He was never overwhelming at Alabama. You know, he was explosive here and there, but, you know, probably not the number one guy, I would say, especially with Devontae Smith and Jameson Williams the last two years. But a guy who I think could be a productive, productive NFL player. Slade Bolden, I think, is a bigger question mark. I think he definitely fits the mold of what the Patriots typically look for in their slot receiver, but mm -hmm. his numbers at the combine were not great. His 40 time was slow. Uh, you know, some of the other drills were pretty slow. So um, maybe less of an intriguing prospect than he was a few months ago after he ran some of those drills, but again, still fits that mold of a guy who can return punts and be a slot guy and even runs the Slade Cat, the Wildcat that Alabama had the last couple of years. Really? Phil? Oh, yeah, the Slade Cat. Yeah, you got to know about it, Tom. Rodak, Rodak filled us in a little bit on this as the college football playoff was going on, and at the time it did, you know, looked like he fit that mold that the Patriots have liked for a long time. But when you go to the combine and you don't test as an explosive athlete, now listen, Wes Welker wasn't the most explosive guy pre-draft when he was coming out. Danny Amendola, same thing. So I wouldn't completely rule out Slade Bolden, but some, you know, guys like Tom, you know this, Julian Edelman and Dion Branch, 
They were elite, elite, elite athletes, and they tested that way. So I'm not sure Bolden really is worthy of a even a day three pick, but maybe he's an undrafted guy, somebody who has some chemistry with Mac Jones. That would make sense. And I'm with Rodak on Mechie. He's probably not going to be your traditional X receiver on the outside, but you might be able to use him outside in spots. I think he's probably primarily going to be an interior player. He's going to be a polished route runner. He's going to be tough. He'll block for you. He's he's not the smallest guy in the world. He measured in at six feet at the combine. So he has a decent frame on him to be able to handle some of that dirty work that the Patriots would ask of somebody who's playing inside the way I think Mechie will. I've seen some seven round mocks that have a defensive back named Jalen Armour Davis ticketed for the Patriots. Phil, you're, no, you're a mock fiend. Can you envision this? And then Rodak, what would the Patriots be getting if they jumped on that player? Well, I can't envision it just because he's a Bama corner and because Nick Saban is so hands-on with his defensive backs at Alabama. So you know he's well coached. I think his size would probably be more of the appeal for the Patriots. He's a longer corner who can kind of play their their man system if, if that's what they're going to do. Probably in the mold of like a, a Razai Dowling going back a while or even Joan Williams more recently. So they, again, there's not a, a huge sample size with him. He only started one year at Alabama. And honestly, people around here are a little bit surprised that he came out when he did, mm. maybe thinking he would stay another year. But a little bit of a mystery, I'd say, with him. Even for us, just we probably talked to him once last year and wasn't really a guy who made plays, but they didn't throw at him a whole lot either. So just a little bit of a guy who is hard to evaluate. You know, there's not a ton of tape, but the Patriots could take a flyer on him probably fourth round seems like the, the sweet spot where he's being uh, talked about right now. Obviously, as we go through these guys, is there any other name that we need to know real quick from Bama? Then I want to ask you a little bit about Bill O'Brien. Sure. Yeah. I, I think there are a couple other names. I mean, Phil Mathis is probably the the guy who might go in the second or third round who I think the Patriots, you know, they did take Barmore last year. So maybe it's not a, a huge position of need, but that's a guy who I think Saban would have a lot of good things to say about. And it's hard to find 300 pound guys to, to kind of fill the middle of your, your defensive line. So, you know, he could be an interesting name for them to pick out. And then, you know, Brian Robinson out of the backfield, if they're looking mm-hmm. for a pass catching guy who can block, I mean, again, probably a mid round pick, but it's just a question of, do they want to stack him on top of what they already have in Stevenson and, and Damian Harris? All right, Mike, want to ask you about Bill O'Brien quickly because Greg Bedard, Boston sports journal had a report this week saying, the reason the Patriots didn't even really try to go after Bill O'Brien to fill their offensive coordinator vacancy was because he had a two-year agreement with Nick Saban and he didn't want to put Saban in position where he's prying a guy from Alabama with a year left on his deal. What can you tell us about maybe Bill O'Brien's long-term prospects uh, down there with the Crimson Tide? And might we be talking about this once again next offseason once his contract potentially is up? Yeah, I don't know how much O'Brien – with the two-year commitment, like, I think if he had gotten the Jaguars coaching job, he would have been gone. I mean, Doug Marone signed a two-year contract with Alabama. He was gone after one year. So I don't know if that played as big a role in it as it did the respect factor that Belichick and Saban seem to have, where if you remember the documentary they did a couple of years ago with NFL films that Belichick and Saban said they don't take each other's guys and they really haven't over time. So I think that probably played a bigger role in it. Um, you know, and O'Brien could leave after this year and, get a head coaching job in college or the NFL. I don't know if it's just a, a Patriots question with him, but I mean, I asked Saban about it in February and he kind of downplayed the idea entirely and it sounded like it wasn't even um, being considered. So mm-hmm. I don't think that was ever really as big of a story as it was made out to be. Well, I mean, you're talking about the dynastic Patriots who have lost the best offensive assistant that anybody's had in the last two decades. So it's like, well, what are they going to do? And they have Mac Jones here. So you have to figure out what the replacement is. So that's why we were so fixated on what seemed like a layup candidate in Bill O'Brien. Rodak, great stuff. Appreciate you. Uh, Roll Tide. Phil, you know what's great? We talked to Rodak, great stuff, great intel. But when he talks about that two-year contract, and we talk about Bill Belichick's contract and his age and the notion that, look, there's a point at which he's going to perhaps even move upstairs. I think that could be something that he does. He talked about it in, uh, well, Seth Wickersham's book alluded to the fact that Belichick could envision himself becoming a team president, a la Bill Parcells. And if Bill O'Brien came in and they had that kind of kismet and they felt comfortable working together, that's not beyond the pale. Not at all. Not at all. And, um, 
you know, I believe that the crafts would probably be open to that. My understanding is they really liked Bill O'Brien when he was here. So if you're looking for a succession plan eventually at some point, you know, Bill O'Brien for all his faults as general manager of the Houston Texans, Tom, you look at his run there in Houston as a head coach, it wasn't bad, especially considering some of the quarterbacks he had to deal with before Deshaun Watson got there and they're making the playoffs. And that, I mean, he had a, he had a pretty good run there. And so with the program built the way it's been built and Bill Belichick sort of passing off the torch, would that make sense? It would to me. I think the question would be, who really wants that job? Does Bill O'Brien want that job to be the guy to follow <laughs> Bill O'Brien? Or sorry, to follow Bill Belichick? Because that's, um, as you can imagine, a lot to handle. It's a lot. And it has with. been in the minds of other people who were considering that position. Or, you know, for instance, Josh McDaniels. In, in, in times I spoke to him over the years, it, you know, it's going to be a daunting job for somebody whether it be him, whether it be Mayo, whether it be Bill O'Brien, whether it be Brian Dayball, give me some random guy, who, whether it be uh, Chad O'Shea. Um, so uh, Bill O'Brien's still just 52 years old, Phil. So he's been around a lot. We've been talking Bill O'Brien talk for a long time, but um, we're draft oriented right now. And as I said, Phil is your draft guy. Next Pats podcast. He's all over it. I'm just riding the sidecar asking him, who's this guy? Muma? I like him. Um, and we're both looking forward to our email and actually snail mail from George Williamson, the codger. Uh, he will be sending along all his picks. He's our longtime friend. He's a uh, boy codger. What are you, 85? I think the codger's 85. He'll be sending along all his recommendations. And we'll share them with you. George, peace out, Girl Scout. Legend. Bill? Take care.